Hello again guys, here's the next installment of our exciting video series. Um, I didn't say this in the last video, but I definitely recommend, um, especially if you're struggling with the book or there's specific questions that you have, to have your book and have it out. Um, maybe make some notes while you're watching the video. I know that's a lot to ask and no one will probably do it, but it is an option that you have. Um, I can always clarify page numbers and things where I got places and information from if you have questions. Um, so at the beginning of the quiz for chapters 100 through 123, I asked you some about Al Dewey. And from reading some of your responses on the quiz, I could tell that some of you weren't quite sure who that is. So um, just to kind of recap and discuss, he's a new character that's been introduced to the book. He works for the Kentucky Bureau of Investigation, which is the state like branch of the FBI and he's the main investigator on the case and um, we see this kind of happening more and more throughout the pages that we're reading but he is really being he and his family's life are really being very heavily affected by the crime and by his investigation of it um, we had talked in the previous video about how they don't really have a lot of clues they don't really know what's going on and a lot of people in the town are very frustrated. Um, they don't understand why he hasn't solved it yet. And he's very frustrated and he's working very hard along with a team of several people to try to figure out why they can't find the clues that they're looking for. And for a while, they really assume that it's because the criminals were so smart and so well prepared that they didn't leave a lot of clues. I don't know about you guys. I don't necessarily think that I would call... Perry and Dick, smart and well-prepared, they do have their moments, but overall, you know, I think sometimes it was just luck that they didn't leave more behind at the crime scene. So anyway, the first question that I asked you on your quiz for 100 through 123 was about why the phone had been ringing at Dewey's house. And um, one of the ways that his family is being affected is that he's getting all these calls at home. And there's calls from reporters and drunk people pretending to confess to the crime. Uh, and it just really shows at this point in the investigation how they don't have a lot of information and how his family is being bombarded at home with crime scene photos and calls. And it's it's very intimidating and very difficult for them. Um, looking more at my notes, we start to find out more and more about the crime. This is a part of the reading that was very heavy into the investigation and the details that Dewey and his colleagues were finding they have noted something that will become significant later. Um, and if you're being astute and if you're paying attention, you may have kind of figured out the significance of this detail. But at the crime scene, they noticed that one of the killers, hint, hint, had done several things to make the family more comfortable. And it's kind of an ironic thing because, you know, Mr. Clutter had his throat slit and the crimes were pretty violent. They're murders. They were intended to be murders from the moment they conceived of the robbery. But there were things done for the family to make them seem more comfortable. Um, in the case of Kenyon, you know, they have him kind of tucked uh, with a pillow under his head. Mr. Clutter is on a mattress box. Nancy and her mom have both kind of been kind of tucked into bed. And like I said, if you're paying attention, it should be obvious to you or Truman Capote would want it to be obvious to you who at the crime scene was involved in doing that. And I mean, I don't want to speak it too plain, but let me just ask you this question. Who do you think would be kind to other humans, even in the moment of their death or even the moment after their death and kind of taking care of them? Do you think that's something that Dick, as he's portrayed by Truman Capote would do, or do you think it's something that Perry would do? I just want you to think a little bit about how even when we don't know that we're learning about Dick and Perry, and we it feels like we're learning about the crime, that sometimes that those are details about Dick and Perry as well, if we're paying attention. Um, so this is the part of the book where Dick and Perry escape to Mexico. And, you know, several of you talked about how they go through the southern states and they have this trip, and they do. Um, when they get to Mexico, they lead a pretty inappropriate life. Um, Dick especially, and again, you know, that characterization from Truman Capote, he's still the bad guy and Perry's not. And it's, you know, it's hard to deal with considering that they're both killers sometimes to think about that. Um, but Dick is sleeping with prostitutes. He gets two women to be so interested in him. 
that he is like engaged to them and uh, they make some friends who take them out fishing and find them a place to stay. And um, I do want to point out just because I'm not sure a lot of you picked up on it. Uh, their German friend Otto and his friend that's with him they're more than friends and they're both guys so you know leading to these theories that we had been talking about that i kind of alluded to at the beginning of the book about the nature of the relationship between dick and perry and what kind of guys they are um, again you know me i would never judge them for their sexuality but during this time period there weren't a lot of people that would have felt comfortable displaying the kind of relationship that Otto and his friend are displaying. And, um, you know, are Dick and Perry comfortable with that because they both are comfortable with gay people? Are they comfortable with it because they are gay? Are they comfortable with it because, hey, you have money and we're taking advantage of you? It's kind of hard to say. Otto is a nice person. You know, he really uh, dotes on them and takes care of them. He does drawings of them. Um, some of them are a little creepy. Some of the drawings of Dick, he's nude. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, it's a good relationship until Otto decides he's going back to Germany. And at this point, you know, Dick and Perry, there's something about money and possessions when you haven't had to pay the price for them, when you haven't had to work for them. And they just got all this money that they have by passing bad checks. They don't really value it in the same way that you or I would, you know, getting it from working. And so they've blown through their money, you know, on prostitutes and drinking and just traveling around. And they haven't been smart and tried to make an investment in themselves or a future scheme or whatever else. They're just not being careful. And so they end up in kind of a bad spot where the money's running out. They start looking into possibly getting jobs. Dick is dissatisfied with the wages that they can earn. And they end up having to get back to the United States without a car because they have to sell their car. And, um, you know, considering what they're facing in the United States, I would think they would have put a little more thought into their plan before they headed out into Mexico. But you know, Dick and Perry aren't really planners. That's not their strength. Um, during this section of the book, we get a lot more background information about Perry. And I feel like I say this every time we're discussing the book, and I'm a broken record probably about it. But think about the kinds of things that Truman Capote is telling you about Perry. Perry wets the bed, which, you know, is and I talked about this in a couple of my classes, it's a psychological sign of a lack of control. You know, you're so out of control of your life and your emotions that you can't control your bladder. And you know, we find out that he was discarded by his family. His mom's a drunk. His parents fought and hit each other and hated each other. And his dad takes him in and then puts him in an orphanage and he gets divided apart from his brothers and sisters. And the nuns beat him and soak him in these icy cold water baths for wetting the bed. And it's this tragic, tragic story of this person who never had a chance, never had a future prepared for him, never had anyone to care about him. And I think we're supposed to feel bad for Perry. I mean, just blatantly, I'll just put it right out there. I think that Truman Capote wants us to feel bad for Perry. And I do. But at a certain point, I think we have to ask ourselves, how responsible are each of us for the things that we choose to do? And this is something that Perry's sister brings up in the letter that she sends him in prison. And I'm touching a little bit on some things that are in the next set of, of reading. But, you know, she says to him, yes, we had a bad life growing up. And yes, things were hard. But you need to stop blaming people and take responsibility for yourself. And in our next set of pages, we're going to talk more about what theories that kind of ties into with some different things about um, the psychology of humans. Um, but we also, and I'm looking at my notes here off the screen a little bit, um, we also find out something really important in this chapter about Perry and his not so distant past, which is that this story that he had told Dick about killing this N-word man, King, in Las Vegas, 
And if you remember, the story is really important in the mythology of who Dick and Perry are and why they come together. This is the story that Perry told Dick that so fascinated Dick that Dick thought, oh, he's such a bad person. I can't wait to use him. Perry never killed the black man that he knew in Las Vegas. They barely interacted with one another. And we can see it's a story that Perry told to impress Dick and it worked, but the foundation for their relationship was that story and the horror, but the love of the horror that it inspired for Dick. And so we find out that Perry's not this natural born killer that Dick thought that he was. And you may have sensed this. You may have seen this coming um, because Perry doesn't really, at least again, as Truman Capote shows him, he isn't really displayed as the kind of person who would do that kind of thing. Um, and so at the end of this set of reading, just to wrap up one loose thread, um, Mr. Helm, the caretaker of the clutter property, we're way back up in Kansas now, he finds a man in the house and the man has a gun and some rope and some things in his car and they think that he may have been involved in the killing. Although, spoiler alert, uh, and I'm going to talk about this now and probably not talk about it much in the next set of chapters, he's not the killer. We already knew that and they find that out as they continue to investigate.